So we're going to talk about hybrid CI/CD with uh, Kubernetes and CodeFresh, and we'll see if we all have <laughs> the same definition of hybrid. Maybe some of you are expecting a different talk. Hopefully not. Uh, feel free to raise your hand throughout if you if you uh, if you have a, a question that you want to get answered right away. Uh, I may shoo you off, but more than likely I'll, I'll invite you to ask your question. But uh, if not, just be persistent. So uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Dan Garfield. I am the Chief Technology Evangelist for CodeFresh, which is a fancy way of saying that I go around and give a lot of talks and do a lot of demonstrations and run workshops and things like that. Um, I'm also a Google Cloud Developer Expert, uh, as well as a member of the Forbes Technology Council. So I do a lot of writing about Kubernetes and CI/CD and uh, DevOps best practices and SREs and the, and the mesh and how they work together. Uh, I'm going to be speaking later this week at the Go Meetup. If anybody's going to be at the Go Meetup, cool. None of you, good. Um, uh, and then just to introduce CodeFresh for those that are unfamiliar. How many people are already familiar with CodeFresh today? Oh, like half the people. Okay. So CodeFresh is a CI/CD platform. Uh, we're designed specifically for working with microservices, working with Kubernetes, working with sort of the cloud native tool set. Now we do have people that deploy legacy stuff using CodeFresh. Uh, I'm always surprised when I talk to a customer and they're like, oh yeah, we're building all of our Android apps on CodeFresh. And we're like, oh, okay, that's great. Uh, you know, we didn't necessarily build like a bunch of amazing tooling specifically for that use case. We really focused on Kubernetes and containers. But that's awesome, we're happy to see it. Uh, now this, this talk really is born out of a need that a lot of our users had and a common and reoccurring set of use cases. Uh, so uh, I'm going to tell you three stories and talk about how we solve these three uh, stories. So first off, how many people have used Kubernetes in the last few days? Okay, for those of you who don't, didn't raise your hand, you probably did and just don't know it, right? Because you probably went to Starbucks in order to drink. Turns out there's a Kubernetes cluster on-prem that's uh, running all those services in that store. Or maybe you, uh, maybe you watched a video on CNN.com and actually were streaming video using uh, not only Kubernetes but also the software that's built using CodeFresh. Uh, so all of you, even if you haven't necessarily heard of CodeFresh, are already CodeFresh users, uh, just like all of you are already Kubernetes users. Now this first story, uh, which I call story one, is I've got uh, I've got stuff behind a firewall. I've got a cloud with resources behind the firewall, and I want to deploy to it. And uh, I want to deploy my artifacts there, and I want to be able to trigger that externally. Uh, I don't necessarily want my, uh, you know, I want to have a centrally managed, easy to use system. I don't want to have to like go on prem. I don't have to want to SSH in or things like that. Um, and the problem is often it's hard to get access to that resource. And as you can see, we have a sad doge here. I know this is an old meme, but it checks out. Uh, but the uh, but you can't deploy, and so he is sad. Uh, so this is this is because this cloud resource, this Kubernetes cluster, is behind the firewall. Even if it's on the cloud, now it could be on prem, right? Uh, a lot of times, this, there's this funny notion. That I asked somebody. Um, I said, "Do you do you deploy uh, uh, behind the do you deploy on prem?" And they said, "They said no, it's in the cloud." And I said, "Do you deploy behind the firewall?" And they said, "Well, no, it's in the cloud." Well, oftentimes, obviously, our cloud resources are behind the firewall, right? So they are secure. Um, so that's, that's one use case. How do we deploy to a Kubernetes cluster that's sitting behind a firewall that we can't, we, can't, we can't just call out to that cluster and deploy to it? So how do we deal with that? That's story one. Story two, what about cloud that is on location? And I mentioned earlier that if any of you have been in Starbucks, uh, you're, you're actually probably using Kubernetes. Uh, they have Kubernetes clusters on-prem. Chick-fil-A is famous for this. Uh, we're doing work with a company called Wawa, which uh, does, I don't know if anybody's from the East Coast, but they basically are like 7-Eleven on the East Coast and uh, similar, similar situation. Uh, so there's, there actually a, a, is a big move to put Kubernetes clusters on-site and on-location to provide services for things like uh, credit card processing, batching, um, also for things like container ships. I know that's ironic, but a lot of container ships now actually have a server rack in them with Kubernetes that's actually providing services on site for that boat. Now this is, uh, this is, this is obviously a problem when it comes to deployment. Uh, so much latency. The, the, uh, the IP is, could be changing all the time. Um, maybe uh, it's not available all the time. In the case of like a boat, this thing <laughs> ships out and you can't, you can't actually reach it for like six months to actually really do a deployment to it. Um, and until it shows up in port and gets reconnectivity and then you actually want to have it run 
its use cases. Um, same thing with, with stores. I was, uh, I was recently at a Del Taco, fine establishment if you haven't been there, very classy. And uh, they said, I'm sorry that w you can't order anything because our, uh, our system is being updated. And I thought, oh no, some DevOps team somewhere is having a bad day because they're pushing hotfixes out at 6 p.m. during the dinner hour, and now no one in all their stores can, can, actually, uh, can actually buy any food. Um, that's always a funny feeling when you're, you're like, well, the food's right there, and I have money. <laughs> Doesn't work. Uh, you got to have the systems in place. So we're, we're seeing Kubernetes clusters actually going on-prem, and uh, this is what I kind of call uh, like <laughs> cloud on-prem, right? It's like the cloud is coming down into you. <laughs> You walk into a store and it's like, oh, this is where the cloud is. It was in Starbucks this whole time. We didn't know. Uh, so this is another situation where I want to deploy to this cluster. I want to keep it up to date. How do I do that? Um, and how do I do it without having a really complex network you know, configuration that I manage? Um, how do I make sure that, hey, you know what? Wherever that cluster is, however it's getting connected to the internet, I want to be able to update it and not have to worry about um, about necessarily maintaining connectivity. I want it to be uh, essentially embrace the, the failure aspect of it. Now, if those of you have, that have read the Google SRE handbook know that like one of the first principles of DevOps is embracing failure mode, like expect things to not work. And so this is a situation where um, it's gonna be difficult to deploy to this cluster because maybe the network gets knocked out. Now, what if the store owner is really creative and gets like a hotspot up to provide services and connects the, the, the store to that network, well, a lot, of, a lot of people wouldn't allow such a thing because this is considered outside of policy, but it actually would end up providing services for people in a pinch, so it would actually be better. You'd like want to give that person a raise. Um, so we want to be able to support this use case too. So this is story number two. I've got a Kubernetes cluster. I've got essentially a cloud on location. Uh, now story number three is, is similar to these, these both, but it's a little bit different. I've got resources behind a firewall. Uh, many of you have uh, compliance issues or security issues. Uh, I always like pe talking to people from the quote DOD. They're like, I'm from the DOD. You're like, oh, okay. So which one? You know? uh, but they have this similar, they have a similar issue, similar situation uh, where you have resources that need to be behind the firewall um, that can't go out. And uh, so this, this becomes a tricky issue, uh, not only when you're trying to reach in and pull code from those areas in order to build or deploy something, but also if you have two different secure areas, how do you, how do you move things between those two areas uh, with CICD in a coherent way? So um, these are the three stories that I want to address today. And this is, the, this is what we're talking about when I'm talking about hybrid, is basically how do you marry in cloud elements uh, with these, these different on-site use cases, with behind the firewall use cases, with secure cloud virtual private network use cases. How do, you, how do you handle all those things in a way that is not super complex? Because obviously, um, for it, everybody's always heard the famous phrase, just talk to your security team and ask them to open up a port on the firewall. Yuck, 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 how's that gone? Uh, it doesn't ever happen, they always say no, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, no, you can't open the port on the firewall. Right, so we want to solve this w in a way that uh, doesn't require opening up ports on the firewall, that doesn't inv uh, require involving you know, 75 different teams to solve the problem. Um, so there are really two different jobs here that we're trying to solve. Um, one is a build agent, right? So the build agent, I'm gonna make the camera people mad. The build agent needs to be able to do things like pull resources, right? Like it's gonna pull code off of this secure network and then you've got the use case of the deploy agent, which is I want to be able to deploy into this area that is hard to reach or is secure or is otherwise inaccessible. And so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna solve this with one tool. We're gonna use the code fresh runner to do this. So we actually have both the deploy agent and the build agent uh, uh, put into a single element that you can deploy and use as either component. Um, and uh, as you can see, it is very secure, and uh, it is also one tool, that is a wow, uh, and also so deploy. So this, these are all good things that you want to have out of your hybrid uh, solution. So that's the CodeFresh runner, and we're going to be working with that today. So how does the runner work? Uh, well, basically, 
you have an instance of CodeFresh running. Now, most of the time, this is actually the public SaaS. So you're just at CodeFresh.io, and that's providing all the services to the runner. And then you have the CodeFresh runner that's behind a firewall. Again, this could be on a boat. It could be in a virtual private cloud. It could be on a smartwatch. It could be on a Game Boy. I don't know if there are any Kubernetes clusters on Game Boys, but we could do that, sure. If anybody wants to do that, let's huddle up afterwards. We'll get this Game Boy thing figured out. Um, that's that, wherever that is, that's where it's gonna be. And the way that it's gonna work is the CodeFresh runner, rather than pushing to it and saying, hey, go do this job, the CodeFresh runner is gonna check in periodically and look for jobs. It's gonna say, do you have anything that I need to deploy? Now, in this case, we're gonna be using the CodeFresh SaaS that's in public internet, but it doesn't have to be. It could be a CodeFresh on-prem installation. So you might be, if you're working at Fort Knox, you could install CodeFresh on that site and then you're deploying out to different vaults or something that are in different networks and you could have the CodeFresh runner actually going over the network to get things in a secure way. Uh, so the great thing about this runner is it, it, uh, it runs on Kubernetes, um, which means that it has all of the, the built-in advantages of Kubernetes, right? It's reliable, it's scalable. Um, every time it runs a pipeline, it actually spins up new pods, right? And so it can actually scale up and handle you know, thousands and tens of thousands of builds. Uh, it uses an open source installer, so you can actually just grab it right now and try it out. Um, and it's only unidirectional, so it doesn't ever get pushed to, it always pulls what it needs. Uh, and this solves 90% of the networking um, uh, challenges that people have with hybrid. Uh, and, uh, and then of course that no open ports needed. Um, uh, it's also fully independent. So what's one of the cool things about this and this is a real challenge, right, is how do you keep this thing up to date, right? So you've got this, right, we, we came in here because we wanted to figure out how to keep our software up to date, but now how do we keep our tool that keeps our software up to date up to date? So you've got to update your thing so you can update the other things, right? So how do you do that? Well, the, um, the way the CodeFresh runner is, works is really intelligent. Uh, if I do say so myself, I didn't write it, but, um, but uh, I'm presenting it. So um, the, what it does is it deploys the engine every time. So uh, we're, we're a CI CD company. How often do you think we should deploy software? Dozens of times a day, right? Uh, so we are, we're, we're always deploying new software. And so the way the engine works is every time the CodeFresh runner executes, it actually pulls the engine that is current and then executes that. So there, it's basically uh, self-updating in that regard. Um, and it deploys that automatically. The other thing that it does is it manages pipeline volumes. Now, for those of you that have already used, used CodeFresh, you know that we have a very unique way of dealing with volumes when it comes to pipelines. So every pipeline, crash course here, um, every step in a pipeline is its own container. And to make facilitating communication between those containers easy, we create a shared volume for that pipeline that every step, every container can read and write to. Uh, so I can do my git clone in one step, and I can do my build in the next step, and they're actually working off of the same volume, and then, we automatically cache that volume, store it, and make it persistent. So every time the pipeline executes, it reattaches that volume. So this means that all of the, uh, all the optimization that you used to do to try to optimize your build times with caching is basically just done automatically in the background. Uh, this is a really, really big value because off the bat, right off the bat, you'll see that your pipelines run much, much faster. Now one of the cool things about this runner is it actually manages this pipeline volume and it pulls it into wherever the runner is executing. So if I have a cached volume sitting in, uh, that, that executed in one cloud and I go to execute this pipeline in another cloud, it actually will pull that volume in to the other cloud and use it as the cache. Uh, it's actually stored as a Docker image. It's like a whole other talk worth of information on the, on the volume and how it works. It's really cool. Um, the other great thing is it just uses standard Kubernetes. So whatever Kubernetes cluster you have, it doesn't really matter what the flavor, you can just deploy the runner on this and it's gonna execute. Now technically, it's, it's essentially a, um, a Kubernetes operator. Uh, that's probably more technical than we need to get into because basically you're just telling it to deploy and it's gonna take care of it. So easy monitoring, easy upgrades, easy to scale, uh, and it can handle multiple runtimes. So um, when you use this with CodeFresh, what we do is we, we allow you to select any runtime environment and these can be runtime environments that are behind the firewall. They can be CodeFresh runners, they can be nodes that are running somewhere. Uh, basically, you can specify whatever runtime environment you want it to run on, and it will run on that environment. And the way that the CodeFresh runner works is it's going to pull 
for builds and webhooks to execute against, right? Um, so this gives you a lot of flexibility. This works with SaaS, it works with AWS, works with Google Cloud, works on-prem data center, all those places. Um, was also, it's uh, predominantly used on Linux, but it also supports working on ARM. So if you need to build uh, a bunch, for a bunch of ARM devices, um, a lot of people, uh, I guess uh, Apple's moving a lot of their stuff to ARM now, so it's getting much more popular. Um, you can do that with CodeFresh. Now, for those of you, is anybody build with ARM today? Don't talk about it anymore? Got it, okay. Um, uh, also, uh, well, the, the other thing I'll mention with ARM is if you don't have a native ARM architecture, your builds take usually five to 10 times longer because they have to work with emulation. So this is a really nice feature to have it, uh, have it native. Um, this also works with Windows. Uh, so a lot of people have still have legacy workloads with Windows that they're trying to migrate over. Um, and CodeFresh uh, does support that as a runtime. So you can actually execute those in a uh, Windows on-prem you know, data center environment. Uh, so today, the environment that I'm gonna use is my laptop. Uh, behold, my Kubernetes cluster, it's not very beefy. Uh, I think I got like eight gigs of RAM in here. Uh, really need to talk to my boss and see if I can spring for the 16 gigs. That's for you, Rezi, I'd like to get more RAM. Just heads up after this. If you could sign the PO, that'd be great. Um, so I'm gonna use that as my Kubernetes cluster. And essentially what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna deploy the CodeFresh runner onto my laptop and it will automatically configure itself against the CodeFresh SaaS and then I will be able to actually execute uh, my pipelines against it. So first, actually we need to install it. Didn't have a lot of time before this, so I didn't get it installed. So I'm gonna get that done now. Uh, so what we're gonna do, first just to prove that it's not installed, I'm gonna go over to CodeFresh here and let's go look and see if I have anything in my runtime environments. Okay, so right now I just have the default provided cloud environment for me. So I need to get this thing installed on my, on my local Kubernetes cluster. I'm using Docker desktop here and you can see that it is pointed at my Docker desktop. Uh, so I'm gonna go over to my terminal here and I'll make this bigger and not so terrible looking. All right, so now I'm gonna do, uh, the tool I'm gonna use is called Venona. This is an open source tool that we offer. And um, I'm going to do install kube namespace codefresh uh, runtime. Now, why am I using an open source utility to deploy Kubernetes resources? The answer is that on this same laptop, I have the CodeFresh CLI installed. And the CodeFresh CLI allows me to talk to CodeFresh and run pipelines and get resources and create secrets and do all these kinds of things. And so I have a context that I have created an auth with. And when I do the Venona install, what it does is it takes the CodeFresh context that I already created and it pushes the, uh, the tokens that it needs into the Kubernetes manifests and then deploys them onto the cluster. So I'm gonna go ahead and deploy that now. And uh, what this will do is it will deploy that, uh, that instance of the CodeFresh runner on my, on my local cluster. And then it will also add all of the authentication information into CodeFresh so it will show up as a runtime. So I'm gonna just double check it here. Uh, I'm gonna run git pods on my runtime. Can everybody see this okay? Maybe want to make it a little bit bigger? I'll make it a little bit bigger. Okay, so this will show me all the running pods that I have. Woo, too big. Uh, so you can see I've got one, two, three, four pods running. Everything looks like it's uh, running properly. Made it a little too big. There we go, that's, that's better. All right, so everything's running. So now if I go back and look in CodeFresh and I refresh this runtime environment page, we're gonna see that that runtime environment is now available for me. Uh, now it has a default set of resources that it's gonna be able to allocate. I can increase this. Um, uh, I don't have more memory on my machine, as I mentioned, uh, so I'm not going to increase it now. Uh, and then uh, I can basically go and execute pipelines in this environment. Uh, now in the background, is CodeFresh going to push a webhook over to the CodeFresh runner? I see everybody shaking their head no because they did a really good job paying attention earlier. In fact, what it's gonna do is it's going to set up a job and it's gonna wait. And the CodeFresh runner is going to ping in and say, hey, do you have any jobs for me? You do, pull in the job and execute, okay? So uh, I'm gonna go to, I've got a project here called Hybrid Examples with four different pipelines in it. Uh, we're gonna go use one of these. I've got a basic build set up here that we're gonna execute. 
And this basic build is going to clone a repo and it's going to build a Docker image. Now, as I mentioned, each step here is executing in a different container. Uh, and in the background, you'll see, you'll see uh, uh, Kubernetes actually spinning up pods to execute this pipeline. So remember, we have uh, one, two, three, four pods currently running. So I'm gonna go ahead and double check my settings. Yes, this is set up to run in my Docker desktop. I set that up earlier. Uh, now, if I actually tried this earlier, this is, would have been fun. I executed this pipeline, but that Docker desktop wasn't installed. Uh, and so it basically just set up the job and waited. And then once I installed the Docker desktop, it actually grabbed the job and executed it. So uh, this is really, really flex a very, very flexible way to handle this. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go ahead and run this. Uh, I probably don't need that much memory, but let's just, let's just use it all anyway, why not? All right, so in the background, this is gonna initialize for a second, and I'm gonna put a uh, watch, well actually let's just wait, let's just see it initializes. So this is now set up the, uh, set up the job, and uh, it's, it's been picked up now. So I can see that actually things are validating, pipeline uh, volume pods are being created, and if I run this again, instead of seeing four services, you can see that I actually have a few more. You can see that this one is 21 seconds old, this one is 21 seconds old. Now, one of these is the engine, and one of these is actually the volume that's being mounted. Uh, so here we can see now that the build is happening. This build should be relatively quick because it is taking advantage of the cache and that volume that was automatically loaded over. So I would imagine this will be done within a few seconds. Though uh, anytime I'm running on my local machines, things tend to run a little bit slower. There we go. So the build was completed in about 27 seconds. Now, for those wondering what the cache got me, and, and by the way, we'll now see that these pods are terminated or shut down. Yep, so you see there, there's no more, the engine that we just started is, uh, is already turned off here. So it's, it's, it's executed. Um, for what, those wondering what this cache got me, so this built in 27 seconds. Let's look at the build I did earlier and see how long that one took. We're gonna look at, man, I'm trying to make the screen too big here. Earlier when I first ran it, there, the no, no cache was present and what you'll see is that my build took like seven minutes, six minutes. It took Wi-Fi minutes. How many Wi-Fi minutes does it take? Too many Wi-Fi minutes. There we go. So you can see it took three minutes, three and a half minutes. So I cut, I shaved three minutes off the build right off the bat just because the cache was present. And then everyone clapped. <laughs> wow! <laughs> so fast! So fast! Much wow! All right, so I've got my build executing here now behind the firewall. It's executing on my laptop. Now, I also have the option to access other resources because of where the, uh, because of where this is, right? So this is executing on my machine, which means it has access to a whole set of resources that CodeFresh on the cloud doesn't, right? CodeFresh doesn't know how to access, you know, uh, the other stuff on the network, the other things that this machine has access to, and this is the common use case of trying to get um, access into like a on-prem uh, uh, source co source code management system, you know, like if I have Bitbucket on-prem or something like that. Um, now I've got a Kubernetes cluster sitting next to that and I can actually pull in those resources and execute my builds. And from a security perspective, is my code going out to CodeFresh? No. It's, it's staying on this machine and building and doing everything that needs to do right here. And so from a compliance standpoint, from a security standpoint, my code's not leaving my firewall. Uh, my build is happening here. This is a safe place uh, and my security people are gonna be happy with me. Uh, we're still compliant, uh, we can still process credit cards, everybody's happy. Uh, and so this is, this is a good situation to be in. Um, so the other thing you can do with this, uh, and actually I, I wanna go just a little bit quicker on the demo, so I'm gonna skip one. Um, the other thing that I can do is I can also, from my machine, trigger and interact with resources in the cloud. So what I've done is I've actually set up a Kubernetes cluster in Azure. So I'm gonna go over to my Kubernetes dashboard so we can see that. So you can see I've got my Docker for desktop sitting behind the firewall so I could actually deploy to this. Um, and I've also got, 
Where's another cluster? Got a couple of clusters in here. Okay, so I've got this cluster called Dan Azure. So this is, this is currently deployed in Azure. And let's say that I wanted to work with that cluster that is accessible from CodeFresh Cloud, but isn't accessible from my machine. How would I do that? Well, I can actually use the CodeFresh API from here to trigger, this is so confusing. Everybody's looking at me like I have no idea what you're doing. What's happening, <laughs> what I'm saying is I've got a cluster over here and I've got a cluster right here. I want to execute a build that happens here, but I want to trigger something to happen over there. Okay, so this is, a, this is a hybrid example, right? So what I've done is we've set up a pipeline, and uh, let me go back to my project here. I've set up a pipeline called uh, Access Cloud Resources. And all this does is you can see that it sets a Kubernetes context to Dan Azure and gets information about it. So this shows that it's running in that cluster, right? Uh, but to trigger this, I have another pipeline called Call Cloud Pipeline. And you can see this one uses the CodeFresh CLI to do a CodeFresh run hybrid examples access cloud resources. And then this will report back the information to me. So this one is happening where? On my Docker desktop. And the other one is happening in the, in the cloud context. So if we look at the access cloud resources and we look under the settings, you'll see that this one is just executing in the default free uh, Linux, Linux plan. Oh, pro plan, I got upgraded. Uh, so now I'm gonna go over to my call cloud pipeline and I'm going to run this. And what we'll see again is this will spin up pods on my laptop that will fire off a pipeline that's going to go and fire off another pipeline that's gonna execute in the cloud. So this is a way that you can actually orchestrate resources in two different areas um, is, is you basically are, are pushing things back to CodeFresh as the middle, as the middle ground here. Now, uh, you'll remember that I referenced that cluster in that pipeline, I just referenced it by name. So how did that get there? Well, I added it to CodeFresh, right? And so I'll show you that in a second. So here now I look at my triggering other pipeline, we can see that the command is executing. So in the background, what we'll see is that this is actually spinning up a second pipeline over here that's going to execute in a separate context. So a lot of times what I see actually is people will do like a build in Windows and then they'll trigger a QA pipeline that runs in Linux. Um, uh, this is very common. Or we'll see people do a build in a secure environment. They'll push their artifact and then they'll trigger a deployment to happen in a, in a separate context where that context has access to be, to be able to do the deployments. So by the way, you can actually chain together multiple hybrid uh, instances, right? So you can have my laptop triggering a hybrid deployment that's behind the firewall using the CodeFresh runner in the cloud that's also triggering a deployment onto one of those boats. Maybe that boat's out to sea, so that job just sits there and waits for the boat to come into port. If its internet connection comes back up, grabs the job and executes. So we can see this triggering other pipeline actually executed, and you can see I actually was able to get information back from that cluster. So here I'm actually getting information about this uh, Dan Azure cluster while executing from this machine. So from a use case perspective, uh, while this is kind of a neat trick, hopefully this is fairly clear about what you can do and the possibilities with, uh, with doing a hybrid this way. Um, it's a more secure way to do it. Uh, so in, uh, in a quick summary, uh, basically CodeFresh, we do have the SaaS option, we do have the on-prem option, but the most popular option that I'm seeing now is now the hybrid option because you eliminate all of the need that you have to maintain this thing, but you also get the secure uh, aspect of what you're looking for when it comes to deploying behind the firewall, having resources behind the firewall, and staying compliant and those kinds of things. So this is actually a very popular option because the number one problem that I hear um, from people that are deploying on-prem CI/CD solutions is keeping them up to date. This is a bit of ironic, isn't it? The whole point of this whole CI CD thing was that we were able to keep everything up to date and deployed really easily, except now I gotta deploy my CI CD system to stay up to date. Um, so that's certainly a challenge. Um, but it's, it's not a challenge when you're using hybrid. Uh, it also gives you that secure access. We didn't have to open up any firewall ports. I don't control the Wi-Fi in this building and able, enable to, in order for my laptop to, to be able to talk to CodeFresh, right? 
Um, and we can handle lots of different runtime environments, and it gives you a consistent experience for the CI CD. Now, uh, there is a sister talk to this that may be of interest for some of you in the room that's all about multi-cloud CI CD. So this is, uh, this is a talk that I would encourage if you're interested. It's at codefresh.io slash events, and you can find this talk. And what it, uh, this talk is actually a lot of fun because we actually do a canary release to two clusters simultaneously and manage failover between the two clusters. And so we actually knock out one cluster, but we still provide um, all, of the, uh, all of our services with zero downtime from, from the first cluster. So this is, a, this is, if you were thinking this was the hybrid talk you were looking for, that was what you wanted to see, I'm sorry that this talk wasn't it, uh, but too bad you already gave me five on the scorecards earlier, so no, go, no take backsies on that. Um, but uh, if you did want to learn about that, uh, that, that is a resource that's available for you. So if you have any questions, uh, I, I, can, uh, I can take one or two questions before we close out. Um, otherwise, you can try this for free at codefresh.io. Uh, you, you can just go there and you can grab the hybrid agent and actually deploy this onto your own machine, on behind the firewall, any of those kinds of things. Um, now, uh, on the question front, uh, I am gonna be upstairs in the speaker, I guess there's a designated speaker area that's, that's roped off or something. I'm gonna be up there for the next uh, 25 minutes to answer questions, but I'm happy if anybody has a burning question right now, I'm very happy to, to give that uh, an answer. Anybody want to raise their hand? Anyone brave enough? Who dares? Say we've got a little bit of time right now for some questions. We've got about 15 minutes or so. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go that long. We, we won't, won't go that long. We, we, if you we guys want to stay in here in silence for 15 minutes, you know, why not? We'll wait. You already rated my comment card. What do I care? No, anybody? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, man, let me come around with the uh, mic. Too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, for the CodeFresh runner, is the only installation option inside of Kube, or is there anything that you could install on-prem for other use cases? Yeah, so you can actually install the entire CodeFresh stack on a Kubernetes cluster. Now, the, the, uh, so if that's your use case, that's totally fine. Um, maybe something of interest, since we have a moment, I can actually show you what CodeFresh looks like on a Kubernetes cluster. So we actually surprise use CodeFresh to deploy CodeFresh. Uh, so if uh, I'm actually looking now at CodeFresh uh, production, don't tell my dev team that I shared it. Um, but if I pull up my Kubernetes clusters here, uh, I can actually see the, uh, actually let's look at the, let's look at the Helm packages. Um, so for example, I've got a load, I'm gonna show you a different one. Okay, so this is the production, it was last modified, our last deployment was four hours ago, and uh, you can see that CodeFresh is actually a Helm chart that's made up of um, a few dozen different microservices uh, that are running there. So this is, uh, this is actually CodeFresh running on top of CodeFresh right now. Uh, now, if I really wanted to upset my uh, engineering team, I could go and do a rollback right here. So um, that would uh, YOLO. Um, anyway, but uh, so so not. I'm just joking. Everybody's like cringing right now. Sorry, I was just just kidding. I don't have access to it. It would it would throw an error. It would tell me no. Uh, but anyway, uh, but yeah, we use CodeFresh to deploy CodeFresh, and it is actually just a Helm chart actually. So you could actually use that to deploy CodeFresh. Yeah, good question. Uh, other questions? Anybody else with a quick question? If not, we can end there. Um, big thank you again. Uh, there are uh, if you if you'd like to follow more events uh, at codefresh.io/events, we have tons of videos there. Um, the video that I just mentioned. Obviously, we have a booth upstairs, so we'd love to have you visit us there. And then I'll be in the speaker area for the next 25 minutes or so. Really appreciate you coming out. Thank you. All right.